Welcome to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. Join us as we share our favorite RPGs, one-shot games, tabletop games, reviews, and convention panels. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. How's everybody doing? Good. Awesome. How's the con been for everybody so far? Fantastic. I love this convention more than any other convention. I've been to some big ones. I've gone to ones that people would be impressed with. This is by far my favorite. By far. Let's go ahead and get started. My name is Brian Haas. I am a film critic for... 30 years, uh, filmmaker, um, I've produced uh, well over a thousand podcasts at this point, um, I, uh, screenwriter, uh, just this last year, uh, I placed 10th in the New York City short screenplay contest, it's just a couple of, yeah, it was, it's like 1,500 people, so I was really super stoked about that, uh, and I just finished a screenplay, like, literally days ago, that I think is probably the best thing I've ever written, so... Uh, and I come here to get in the right mind frame to write and talk about things that I love, like horror. So that's me. I'm Jill Knowles. Um, I write horror and dark fantasy. And I think the other relevant thing is I just so happens I work at Barnes and Noble, <laughs> and we just had Halloween, and so I've got a whole bunch of books that I think will fit with our um, our discussion that I can recommend because. Uh, my name is John Warner Jacobs. I'm uh, a novelist. I've written 11, I don't know, around 11 novels. Um, I am also a screenwriter. Um, my, I'm best known for my latest work, Election Seething Hell. It's been optioned for television by the production company awesome. that did Black Panther by the screenwriter of Black Panther. Oh, yeah. And... Um, uh, my fiction has pl- appeared in like Southwest Review and Playboy magazine and various other places. Um, anyway, and I love horror. I love horror films and I love horror books and I um, I like all the creepy stuff. Hello, my name is Marty Catola. I'm a local filmmaker. I've made uh, five films over the last um, 15 years or so. Uh, my fourth film is called Revenge of Zoe. It's currently on Tubi, where, where a lot of Awesome. movies are to watch the best. and uh, my latest movie Love Song of William H. Shaw we shot some scenes for it here at Tuscon about three years ago and so that'll finally be coming out early next year and we're going to be showing some clips from it in the video room tonight awesome yeah what time well, around 10 o'clock oh, I'll, I'll, I'll totally be there cool sweet all right so we're going to talk about some bold horror statements today I love this. I've done this panel at so many different conventions, and I really love this one. My first bold horror statement right now, this very second, is the best that horror films have ever been in the entirety of the history of film, right now. And people go, well, how can you say that? It's a bunch of remakes and a bunch of, you know, reboots and reimagings and all that, right? If if that's what you think, sure, maybe some of the mainstream stuff is, but there is a plethora of stuff out there from lots of diverse voices um, that are just giving me amazing stories from different perspectives that I could never even imagine in a million years. Uh, And it is just a wealth of movies out there right now. So I'm just gonna, just these are just ones from like the uh, the last year or so. Wendell and Wild, which is on Netflix. Werewolf by Night, which is fucking amazing. Oh my God. Deadstream, Dark Glasses, the new Dario Argento. Um, There's a bunch of like trash filmmakers that I love, Psycho Ape. Don't Fuck in the Woods 1 and 2, both on Tubi. You should watch them. Karis Hell and Karis Hell the Second about a killer uh, unicorn that's on a carousel. So, yes, that's really a thing. Um, 
the new Hellraiser is amazing. After 30 years of getting kicked in the teeth, we finally get a good Hellraiser. Uh, Barbarian, when the screaming starts, glorious, bodies, bodies, bodies. Um, Pussy Cake and Pennywise, the story of it, are both on Screenbox right now. It's a great service if you've never heard it. Uh, Prey was pretty good. I think people like Prey. Um, the Black Phone, Hellbender, The Stylist, Lucky, Malignant, The Night House, My Heart Can't Beat Unless You Tell It To, The Empty Man, Vicious Fun, where I could just keep going for like the rest of this time and just talk about these movies. Um, but again, it's like diverse voices. I've, I've seen so many people of uh, color get opportunities to write and direct movies. Um, I'm seeing a lot of trans filmmakers get opportunities now. That, that would have never... There's an 18-year-old uh, trans girl in Australia, Australia named uh, Alice... Shit, that's going to bother me. But um, she made a movie called So Vamp that's on Shudder. It's amazing. She just finished another movie that I just saw at a film festival. It's even better. She's 18 years old. I'm furious at how like talented she is. I was like, what? You're this focused at 18 years old? What are you doing? So I say right now is the best time that we've ever had for horror movies. And I would I would put the same out there for fiction. The, there are so many books out that are just incredible. They're from the uh, Native Americans. There's some amazing, amazing Native American horror out there. There's some funny stuff. There is, it's just really unique takes on the things that scare us, and I, it's, it makes me so happy. So what do you guys think? Is right now the best time for horror? I've not noticed it. You've not noticed it? Not noticed it? I, I agree with you, your yeah. general statement, because it's um, horror, and I think a lot of the success of horror fiction um, is cross-fertilized by the success of horror films mm -hmm. and television. Um, so it gets people into the world, uh, into like sort of liking horror. I think it's really, I, I, I think uh, one of the things that really is the driving motivator for diverse voices in horror is Jordan Peele's ascent. Oh, God. Uh, what a godsend um, he, he I mean, was. Like, you can't talk about like the rise of, of modern mm -hmm. horror without addressing, you know, the. Um, Jordan Peele's effect of like using horror as like obvious social commentary, even though George Romero was doing it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, 40, 40 50 years, years ago. ago. Yeah, right. But it, I mean, he drove it home mm -hmm. for more diverse voices. Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on. And also, traditionally, you can make, uh, you know, a horror. There's a couple of movies that you can make <laughs> that are real cheap. You yeah. can have you have a bunch of teens and a bucket of blood and a knife and a mask. In, in, a, in a single location, you can make a horror movie, right? I mean, traditionally, you get Cabin in the Woods, right? Um, but And there's crime, which is horror's sort of kissing cousin. Yep. Um, and porn. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, yeah. Because like a, lot of, a lot of horror uh, has, you know, the sexual overtones. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the sex equals death. Don't fuck in the woods. Yeah, don't fuck in the woods. One and two. I, there's I, two I of them. I really want to see that. Now. It's really good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, I think uh, film, just in general, is probably at the best place it's ever been right now, just across the board with all the genres. They all kind of feed into each other. You know, the same people work on all the different movies anyway. But, yeah, I think it's just been a great time. Of course, you get a lot of garbage along with sure. it, but that's just because there's more of everything. But. You get oversaturation, for sure, because the, it's largely democratized now. The digital revolution made it so that everybody can make films, you know. And so because of that, Everybody can make films now, so yeah. you sometimes can get lost in the crowd. But it's I think it's great because like it gives everybody an opportunity. Yeah, it's um. But it, there's a law, and I can't remember the guy who made it up. But it's like ninety percent of everything is crap. Right. Right. Uh -huh. He's got to find the good stuff. Yeah, but also like the the thing about crappy horror though is it's still enjoyable. <laughs> sure. You it's know, like pizza. Uh, yeah. You know, it's like, like even a bad pizza is not that bad. You know, yeah. still pizza. That's a crappy. <laughs> there's so there's so many bad martial arts movies out there, but, oh. but even the bad ones are wonderful. Yeah, I agree. I, I love. I, I'm just so in awe of anybody that can make a film. Like make any film that exists is a miracle. It really is. It's so hard to make a film and to get the, that many collaborators to do one thing and then get it released and mm -hmm. get distribution on top of that. So 
yeah, I see those movies that have zero production, but and I still love them because like somebody put their heart and soul into that. You know, it's, I think it's great. What's your first bold horror statement? Um, one of the books, uh, it, there's two of them so far that are really interesting, and I've not, I've seen it done, I've never seen it done really well. Um, there is a wonderful comedic horror, probably going to be a third, at least four, and a fourth book. Um, Kira Jane Buxton, Hollow Kingdom is the first book, Feral Creatures is the second book. It is a zombie apocalypse as told from the point of view of a pet crow. <laughs> and so it looks at how, and it's silly, I mean, and there's parts that will make you laugh so hard you snort. There are many parts. But there are also some scary parts, and it really makes you think. What happens to all those nuclear, nuclear power plants when there's no more humans to run? Well, <laughs> things go wrong. You know, what happens to the poodle that's locked inside and the owners just got eaten by a zombie? How do we save that pool? So it's a, it's a unique take on just how much impact humanity has had on this planet and how quickly that can just go wrong and then nobody cares and you just go on. And I, I feel like it's they're really fun. They're really funny, incredibly well written, and you will be thinking about everything you see around you after you read them. So I feel like that was pretty cool to look at it from a humorous perspective. I like that. I like the idea of a pet crow having the opinion <laughs> his about name, everything. His name is Shit Turd. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody calls him ST. Oh, yeah, that's fair. But yeah. How are you? Um... <clears throat> Uh, I, I think one of the things that I noticed when you were reading off, uh, I find that most of the horror that I tend to really gravitate to, I'm not saying that, I, I, you know, it's my favorite, but um, are the, is South American and Asian horror. Oh, yeah. Um, because they're doing things like, incredible. you know, the, I think the great part about South American and Asian horror is they haven't really sort of bought into the three-act Hollywood mm -hmm. structure, so you get these tales are that, that sort of break form, right? Mm -hmm. And that's great because it's different. And, you know, I want different things. Mm -hmm. So there's like Mexican filmmakers and Argentinian uh, horror filmmakers, like uh, Tigers Are Not Afraid, Lisa which is Gonzalez a beautiful. Is, oh, I love her so much. It, it's, it is a, a brutal and Lopez. beautiful movie Lopez. in terms. Uh, I mean, it's art. Like, it's like it elevates it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a movie, there's an Argentinian movie, and you probably know the, the director. I can't remember, but. Um, it's called not terrifier, but terrified. Oh yeah, uh, and um, it's a, it's it's about a haunted neighborhood, yeah. not a house, but it's fantastic. And, and um, there's it's scary as fuck. Too. It, yeah, it's very very frightening, and I just feel like um, they're doing really interesting things. Indonesian horror is, mm -hmm. is hot, like uh, Satan Slays, yep. the remakes. Jokar uh, and Warner. Yeah, and um, and. Uh, uh, what's the one? Um, the devil may take you, or uh, yeah. the, de the devil may take you. I think. Yeah, and the devil may take you too. Two, yeah. Which which is like a, a Indonesian Gonzo Evil Dead movie. Yeah, and it's exactly it's amazing. It I, I, like, um, but they don't they don't travel down those predictable paths that you expect them to. Uh, they're weird. They're different, and uh, I really like that. So I think those are like what I'm really gravitating towards. Yeah, the the three act structure is. I'm not. It's not going to go away. No. Because it's it's traditional and most people like that storytelling. But what I really love about this new generation of filmmakers is they don't give a shit about the rules, right? They are going to do what they want to do. And uh, one of my favorite things that's come out of like this this style of filmmaking and the streaming revolution is 75 minute movies, where it's like it's the story. There's no fat. It's like this is what the story is, and it's done. Right, we don't have to worry about putting commercials in for when it's going to play on, you know, the Saturday after. We don't care about that shit anymore, right? It's that's not the model that we use, you know. And so, like, there's not a producer that's saying, "Well, that's got to be that's got to have another 15 minutes so that we can package that," you know, with all the other movies that we sell. Nobody cares anymore, you know. It's the same reason we get three-hour movies too, um, you know, because like, you want to tell a three-hour story, and if you can tell a three-hour story, I'll I'll watch it. Drive my car. 
um, the movie from last year. It seems like that would be the most boring, and I was engrossed. I was just so torn for those characters, and like just my heart is for And it's it didn't seem like three hours at all. So like, I think the rules are just they're there, and like people are you're going to be probably more you know commercially successful if you follow the rules. But if you don't care, you can do whatever you want now, and I think that's great. Yeah, in indie films, it's, it's mostly, in, you know, oh, yeah, it's outside sure. of the studio machinery. Mm -hmm. And that's where the real interesting stuff happens. Uh, my, my kid was like, I'm, Dad, I'm thinking about going to film school. And I was like, don't go to nope. film school. I was like, just go make a film. Yep. And do I, it in Arkansas, where I'm from. Yeah. And, and like, that's how you get in. And mm -hmm. I promise you, if you make it, you just, you'll, your first one will suck. Make a short film. Your second mm -hmm. one will suck less. Your third one will suck even less. Mm -hmm. And and then people from Hollywood will be calling you. Okay. Like, that's the way in. You go out into the fields of America, or, you know, you go out into the country mm -hmm. and make something, and it forces you to write well and to figure out how to use your resources, and that's how that's how you do it. I mean, I, you the, know. The Terrifier people, Terrifier 2, that just came out, right, that they crowdsourced that, and it made $10 million on, you know, it's supposed to play three days. It's been, it's now seven weeks that it's been playing. Um, and... Those are DIY guys from the East Coast. They're not, those aren't Hollywood guys. And they broke in in a big way and may have changed the way that like Hollywood, Hollywood looks at terms of like booking, you know, like movie theaters and stuff like that. And like, you're gonna see people getting opportunities now because they made it for $250,000 and it's made 10 million bucks. And that's just, they haven't even started selling the, the physical media yet. And those people are rabid, so they're going to make another ten million probably on top of that for a movie that costs nothing. You know, I tell people all the time. People come up to me and they're like, "What film? What film school should I go to?" I'm like, "Take your camera on your phone and make a film, right?" If you go to, I, I, I tell people if they go to film school, do it for the networking, do it for the collaborations. That's the only reason to do it now, because no. there's no, there's you can find people that will in your your neighborhood, your area, whatever, that will want to do it. So just do it. And he's right. Your first one's going to suck, and the second one will suck a little less. And then once you've done it three or four times, people go, wow, this is actually pretty polished and good, and you know, you seem to have the structure down. You, you can, uh, you, I have a perfect example of this trajectory, and I always mess up their names because I have friends with names very similar, but it's like... Um, Aaron Moorhead and Moorhead and Benson, yeah. Benson. Yeah. and um, so their first movie was called uh, Isolation or something Res like that. Uh, Resolution. Resolution, and it was like a cabin in the woods type thing, but it had a clever premise, but yep. it was not a good movie. Uh, their second movie was, uh, but you could see there was potential. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and it was like about an addict that 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 there was, you know, some, he's trying to get him clean. Yeah, so it, they go to this cabin in the woods and weird shit starts happening. Yeah. And then the, their second one was much better. Mm -hmm. Their third one was amazing. The third one's called The Endless. Yeah. And it's like one of the best Lovecraftian horror Cosmic movies horror. I've seen in ages. Right. And it's so subtle. Yeah. That's the best part is it's so subtle. And then there, I think they might have had one. There was one called uh, Spring. It yes. was like a love story. Spring, Spring is my favorite of theirs. Yeah. And it's, it is. It's it's a love story about a guy who falls in love with a girl who might be a squid. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but so, like, the, they keep getting better, and they're all do, they're all DIY outside of the studio system. But now they're, they are, they've been, they just directed the Moon Knight. Moon Knight, yeah. They yeah. brought him in, because, like, they deal with time, and a lot of their stuff, and Moon Knight deals with time. And they're like, well, who can direct something about time? They go out and they get these guys... We're making nothing move. Like resolution costs what five thousand yeah, dollars? Yeah, yeah. It's one room yeah. with two people. There's no budget to that at all. And oh, and now, they, and they both act in their movies too. Like yeah. They, oh yeah, they act in their they, own movies. They yeah. do all. They're the actually posts. quite great. You yeah. know, I'm like they show up in other people's movies yeah. now. Um, but like Disney was like, yeah, let's go give those guys a shot. You know, making a five thousand dollar movie, and now they're doing Disney stuff. And I feel like more so than any other time, it's. The field is wide open. Wide open. There's you can do you can do a movie or a book. Um, there's it, it, I love this book because the title makes people so uncomfortable. Um, there's a wonderful book by a Native American author called the The Only Good Indians. Yep, Stephen Graham Jones. And yeah, yeah, and it's so different than what we would normally see. But it's a fabulous book. 
Um, there's a new one. I have not actually read it yet. It's, I have. Um, no, I have read that one. Uh, but uh, there's a new one called um, White Horse. Yes, that and just came out last Tuesday. Just came out, yeah. yeah. And um, again, Native American woman whose mother abandoned her when she was only a few days old. She inherits a bracelet. It has her mother's spirit attached to it. So mother didn't abandon her. And it tackles a little bit on the edge of the um, missing and murdered indigenous women. And that huge, huge problem and taps right into it. And it's just, it's so good. There's a movie called Blood Quantum that does very some, it's a, it's a Native American zombie movie. And the Native, the Native Americans don't get attacked and they can't understand why. Um, and so, and it's, it's in Montreal, I think, cause that was where a lot of the indigenous, like the, where they were just trying to strip them of their identities yeah. and you know, send them to the state schools and stuff. And that's where all the mass graves are and stuff like that. Um, and you know, it's like indigenous filmmakers directing indigenous people, and it's a it's, oh, it's just like so unique for a zombie movie. Like I was so bl like blown away, or like that Train director, of Basan. unfortunately just died. Oh, that's such a um, bummer. But like Train to Basan is another one where you know, like they just they have this really different you know look at like what a zombie movie can be. Like I've never cried in a zombie movie before. I, I cried like a baby in you know, Train to Basan. Um, it's just incredible. So, yeah, I agree. You're awfully quiet on that. <laughs> you know, just letting you guys go. Uh, so, my first love uh, of film has always been horror movies. They're the reason I'm a filmmaker, but I always ended up gravitating more towards comedy instead because back in the 80s, they always told us, you know, in Fangoria, do not start by making a horror film. You will be pigeonholed in the right. genre forever, right. and you'll never be able to make anything else. But now, it feels like that's not the stigma as much anymore. Now that you're seeing comedians go into making horror films, right. it feels like, hey, this is a perfect time to cross over. And you know, my next project, one of my next projects, actually is going to be a, a horror movie. So it just seems like the, the time to. Uh, oh to yeah, the, um, Hotel Six 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 was that what it was called? What was the Foo Fighters? Oh yeah, I still Studio Six Six. Studio Six Six Six. Yeah, it's yeah. very fun. But I want to do something that kind of, like you're saying, the rules are out the window yeah. and, and just play with the, a movie about, I like movies about filmmaking, about the process, yeah. and so I'd like to mix something up with how the rules of making the horror movies have changed into the movies. Not so much a screen thing, but a little, a little bit different than that. Yeah, there's definitely opportunity for that, mm -hmm. um, for sure. And also, like you were saying about the film school, yeah, there really isn't much of a reason to go outside of networking. I mean, with with you, with every movie available at your fingertips, you can watch every old movie and listen to every commentary mm -hmm. track out there and pick up stuff that way. But it's also like it's easier to, to network when you have a product. Oh yes. So if you you know <laughs> like if you make a, a short like a short yep. film, you go to like it's a calling card. Yeah, yeah. You go to conventions and, and enter them and. In, in each convention's little film fest, and I've literally yeah. done this. I did this for a hundred dollars, <laughs> and they'll just you did that for a hundred dollars. Yeah, I did that for a hundred dollars. I mean, it took a lot of planning or whatever, but yeah, I, you know, yeah, I it's do not that the all time, the time. You know, yeah. not your not your time, but yeah, right, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I say consistently from installment to installment. Child's Play is by far the best of any horror series. I don't think it's even close. I think other series have the higher highs, and other series definitely have the lower lows, for sure. Um, but like the consistency of Child's Play from the very beginning all the way through the Chucky series, it's really, really fun on USA. I haven't caught up on season two yet, but season one is awesome. Um, it's because it's all Don Mancini. Yeah, from yeah exactly. The and that, that was the point I was going to make. It's, it's been consistently the same writer or director the whole time. And I just think that that's where I think a lot of the messiness gets involved with the series, like Halloween or... Friday the 13th. I think they finally fixed the Friday the 13th thing. I think they're <laughs> going to start coming out again. So um, that was pretty wild. Um, the taking back of the rights and stuff like that. That was something I never saw in a million years. Um, but um, because it's a different creative team for you know this 
Friday the 13th movie versus that Friday the 13th movie. And they want the mask to look a little bit different. They want Jason to move a little bit different. And they want, you know, Michael to hold his knife this way instead of that way, you know, and do the, the head tilt or what, you know, they all want to put their little, you know, idiosyncrasies on it. And so a lot of times what happens is they just dump a bunch of stuff on top and hope that it's, you know. And horror is one of the few places you can really get away with that. Oh, yeah. Is, you know, Cabin in the Woods. Think of um, the, the final nightmare. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when they figure out that, that no, Freddy's actually gotten loose into our world. And, and it works. And it works well. And you can just, you can do any. There's a wonderful, wonderfully terrible uh, 80s horror flick called They Live. It's not and terrible. Oh, it's it's, terrible it's, at it's, all. It's what gorgeous. are you talking about? <laughs> you can say, with, you know, Ray Bands that. that Make it so you can see the alien. And it has the single best line ever. Poor uh, John Carpenter. Like, I know that he's like a super, like everybody loves him now, right? And he's a but rock he star. so much crap. He got beat up for so many years, and all the guy did was make 10 classic movies, you know, all time classic movies. I mean, if you look at like Halloween or The Thing or, um, you know, In the Mouth of Madness, which I, I think oh, is the, brilliant. I think that's the best Lovecraftian movie ever made, right? Um, all that guy did was just turn out classic after classic and nobody would go to his movies. Like, what? You know? And like now we go back and look at, you know, somebody asked him, they were like, you know, how, how does it feel, you know, to have the thing, you know, re-examined now as like a classic? He's like, I mean, I guess that's great now, but like it certainly didn't help me make any movies then, you know? Um, and so, like, you know, he's one of the reasons, you know, like, every time there's a sequel, and, you know, like, I'm not a huge fan of the new Halloween movies for a myriad of reasons, um, but, like, I always think of John Carpenter holding his hand out, and he said, the check just magically appears. And I'm like, you know what? Okay, fine. You know, Hollywood, uh, Halloween ends can be a huge piece of shit. That's fine. John Carpenter still got his money, you know, and I can ignore it and just it, pretend like it's just, the first one exists, and... I don't even know what that is. So. But, yeah. Poor John Carpenter. I know. But he's so wonderful. He's brilliant. Yeah, but he's a little prickly. I, I'm sure he didn't do himself any favors, you know, because he's not the the most uh, social guy in the world, and it, it's just kind of a grumpy old man. But I might be grumpy, too, if he I made all those. It. Yeah, if I made all those classic movies, and people are just like, Ugh. I might be a little hurt about it too. Yeah, he never recovered from that uh, Invisible Man movie, did he? Right. Listen, I mean, Stephen King was on. Um, he supposedly he's supposedly he, directing a new movie, so I don't know if that's true or not. But he was on Stephen Colbert, and he was asking about how, you know, how does it feel to be, you know, the the, the writer of, of yeah, you know, and get run all these accolades now, you know, and. When you started out, there were so many nasty things written about you. Stephen King said, I'm still alive, and they're all dead. <laughs> and it was wonderful. Yeah, I asked John Waters a similar question, and he had a very similar answer. He's like, what do I care? Those guys are all gone, and I'm still yeah. here. Still gone. Still making movies. What other bold horror statements do we have? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, why don't we open up to some questions? Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I was 100% going to do that. So what, what about you guys? What do you guys think for both horror statements? Yes, right here. Uh, this is just something that you remarked on that's really easy to make a film. Uh, I remember a long ago some film professor told me that he warned us don't make, he warned us about not making our own films because you might get sued and when you put your money into it, you might lose it all and always buy a lot of insurance and beware of liabilities. Is there, if you make a your own film, do you feel there's danger of like something like that? Happened well, I don't think they're going to come and take the nothing that I have. So, you know, if that's what you're asking, um, like, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination making boatloads of money off of my stuff. Um, I would quite honestly be surprised if anybody cared that much. Um, like I, so the biggest thing um, for me, like there, Lloyd Kaufman, who has made movies for 50 years for Troma, 
um, has really one rule, you know, it's make sure that everybody's safe and then make a good movie, you know. So like, and that's really my only, you know, like I want to make sure that everybody, and we do, some, like I ran a live chainsaw in a house, I shot a shotgun in a house, I did all sorts of crazy shit that is very dangerous, but we made sure that like it was going to be safe when we did it. And, um, and I, I, I guess there's like no way to be 100% foolproof. You see like accidents happen with Alec Baldwin or like the crow, you know, all those years ago or whatever. Um, but like, I mean, I, I can't be ruled by. Have you ever what, purchased insurance? No, nah, I mean, I've never done anything that was like commercially relevant, so I don't think it was really, I mean, the filmmaking piece is more for me than anything else. So um, if I were to do it professionally, I would 100% make a LLC and do exactly what you're saying. Yeah, so. I, I had to get liability on my last production because some of the locations I was shooting at demanded mm -hmm. that I have it. They were like, "Well, we can rent it to you if you get if you get the insurance." And, you know, really wasn't that much. Yeah. We split it between all the different producers, and then it was kind of like, "Hey, we got insurance. Wow, we're, you we're feel you feel right. like a <laughs> real filmmaker, right? right. Yeah, yeah." Some of the Ed Wood filmmakers. There's, I love Ed Wood and filmmakers. You know, and, and everybody talks shit about Ed Wood, but you know what? They're talking. About we're still Ed watching Wood. his movies today. They're still good. I don't care what anybody says. I'll watch Brian the Monster right now with anybody, <laughs> and we'll have a fun time. I promise you. Who else has some bold horror statements? I don't like slashers. Okay. Like you were like, uh, I like Chucky. Yes, yeah. it's, it's funny and it's absurd. But like Halloween, I'm like, uh, I, and I watch them, but mm -hmm. I'm like, eh, this is this is too real for me. <laughs> like. So, I, so I like yeah, you I like know. A, I want a monster. Yeah, and because it's easier it. to compartmentalize those things. Uh, yeah. Because, for me, I don't need a, a reminder that there's maniacs that want want to kill me for whatever reason. With, I, with I'm always knife. able to like since I know it's not real. You know, if I'm watching something that was like you know like the Dahmer thing, right? Yeah. It just came out on Netflix. Bothered me to no end. Um, and it's just like you know it happened, right, or whatever. But like. That you know, I can watch Hostel, I can watch Saw, sure. I can watch all that. Doesn't bother me one bit, right? Or like the movies where, and there's, they are misogynist, misogynistic. A lot of them, um, and like I have to, you know, think about that stuff while I'm watching it. You have to be aware of those things. It's okay to watch problematic things as long as you know they're problematic. Um, and so, but. Yeah, I totally get not like it's, I mean, you know, the, the slashers are the non-cerebral part of horror, you know, um, and so, but part of me just loves watching people run around with some crazy weapon, you know, trying to kill one another. Like so. that commercial where they go, don't get them, get yes. the car and they go underneath all this, oh. Let's go hide behind the chainsaws! <laughs> and the, and the bad guy's like, oh. What are you doing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, back there. So my thing Gore is not scary. Mm -hmm. Those are two, and a lot of times you get into a movie and it's supposed to be a horror movie and it's just gory with blood and intestines and the gross, squishy sounds. Yeah. But I'm not scared. I'm just gross. Yeah, so. The uh, hitcher. Yeah, I'm going to be scared. Well, there's so many Rutger Heller movies. I'm sort of like, there's two different, you know, feelings for that. Mm -hmm. um, so. I get what you're saying because it's it is just gross, right? I love gross movies. The grosser, the better, right? You know, drop drop buckets of intestines on me. I love it. Um, but um, to me, like what I find sort of scary about the gore stuff is that that's really what's going on inside of me, you know. Yeah. And so, like seeing that viscera is just really. Um, I don't know. It's it, like it just it puts me in that place. I think you know of like you know, and so feeling that uh, feeling of like experiencing it without experiencing it, which is I mean ultimately what horror is all about, you know. Um, so yeah, I but you know, and then the other side of me is like I love the the really sophomoric silly ones from like the 70s where it's just they went down to the butcher shop and go give me all of the whatever you got left over we're making a horror movie <laughs> you know um and so um 
but yeah, no, I mean, I don't find gore score that gore scary. Um, for the most part, it, sometimes in body horror, you, it can be used effectively for that yeah. purpose. It's just saying the color out of space. Yeah, so, yeah. Well. So I mean, Good yeah, because body horror does. Because the body horror to me is like your body rebelling against you. So that's you know how do we, how do we look at something like cancer or something like that? You know, it's super depressing if we just talk about cancer. But if like a color from space turns you into a monster, I think I, I think I can palette that and still get the allegorical references of like my body betraying me. I think gore can make scary more scary, but it can't replace it. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like the, the usually gore is, I mean, at this point it's a trope. So it's yeah. like, like um, it's, you know, you got, you have kills, you know, kill counts mm -hmm. and people, you know, and it's, it's a very, um, I'm not, I, don't, I don't know if, if I'm going to say is a um, juvenile way of looking at it, but, you know, horror movies are traditionally marketed to young people. That they're, they're about young people. It's rare that horror movies, you see that more nowadays, yeah. horror about, so horror movies are usually ageist. They're only focused on the teen, you know, the, the, the sexually active. It's rare that you have stories about adults and the ones that you do have stories about are really effective like um the my mom just died of dementia and so i watched this right. movie um with um is is the the taking of oh, the sarah taking logan of De De yeah deborah logan, deborah logan. Yeah. it's about a woman who is losing her faculties um or is she or is she possessed or, or like uh, you know possessed by some entity you don't know and I was like, God damn, this is this is too hard for me, you know, like because I was going through it with my mom. But um, yeah, to your point, uh, like gore. I don't think gore is inherently scary. It's kind of the money shot. It's like right. oh, you yeah. laugh, like it's, it's a porn. it's a it's actually a release of yeah. tension. You know, it's like so you have these moments like in music of tension and release. Like you build the tension, and then it's released so that you can build to the next little crescendo. And it's effective in that way, but uh, for me, the scary things are always the things that are unspoken and unseen. Well, yeah, I'm thinking, you know, the classic horror novel is The Haunting of Hill House. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And whatever walks there walks alone. The original but scares the shit out of me this day. Yeah. You never know in the book, is it, did it really happen? Or is it all or in is mind? It all in, is this somebody losing their mind? Mm -hmm. Is this a collective? You know, like mass hysteria thing. It's it's so well done, and it's never on camera. The horror is almost never on mm -hmm. camera. It is just insidious, yep. and it's it's check the cat scary. Yeah, it's you. You I, read that book. You hear a noise, and you check the cat. Yeah, the right. cat doesn't freak out. Yeah. It's good again. Yeah, um, yeah. I I want to piggyback off of what you said about adult horror because, like, I think we're really having a renaissance of adult horror right now. Um, like, there's just stuff that really speaks to, you know, like the horrors of aging. Like, Relic is, you know, you were talking about Deborah That's Logan. There's a movie called Relic that is uh, just incredible about dementia. Same thing, where it's just like. It will rip your heart out. And yeah, on it. it's yeah. Um, like, oh, anything for Jackson. Yeah. Uh, oh, and this is, this is a funny side note, but the filmmaker of that makes Hallmark films. Mm -hmm. That's what he does. He makes these confections, these like sugary Hallmark movies, and then he goes and he's like, "Well, this is what I really want to do." The, and he you'd made, be surprised the overlap. Yeah, you would be surprised because how many people do. Hallmark movies and horror movies, yeah, back to back well, all the time. But the folks that own Harlequin are the the same people that own um, the Executioner book series for oh, guys. Yeah, same yeah. company. Um, but um, another really good um, adult horror movie is The Night House. Deals with grief. Yeah. Um, my friends. I mean, this is one of my so. I didn't get into like talking and networking with all these people to, you know, like no famous people, but like my friends who wrote this movie called, um, oh shit, I forget what the first one was called, um, but they, they wrote The Night House and then they wrote The New Hellraiser, right? Um, and The New Hellraiser is like this really heartbreaking Ruffner. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and, um, yeah, Bruckner's the director, and um, Luke uh, Piotrowski and Ben Collins are the writers. 
Um, Luke Pietrowski was the guy who convinced me that I should get a writing partner because I we would we would talk and I just you know tell him these things and he's like yeah this is the kind of stuff that I just bounce off of Ben he's like you sound exactly like me you you want it to be perfect and Ben just wants that shit out as fast as as possible he's like get a writing partner they will help you and I'm like yeah. okay, okay I have I guess. one for screenplays yeah and so and I did it and it immediately made me a better writer like it was unbelievable I just couldn't even I just, and I thought writing is such a solitary you know um hobby or focus or whatever you know and it's really not you know like one of the, my favorite things about this convention is the networking and meeting all these people and being able to bounce ideas off of people because like we do it all the time um i can tell you right now that the the best person that i ever got to bounce ideas off of i got from this conference so and it's just you know, putting yourself out there and, uh, you know, being open and like, I say, keep your skills sharp. That's another thing that I like to tell people. Um, I don't, you know, I like to write a lot. I like to edit a lot so that when I do jump into making a movie or writing a screenplay or something like that, I'm not starting from scratch. You know, I'm, I got a running start already. You know, I'm not get, I'm not shaking the rest off. It's just like, let's do this. You know, let's go. I think it's important to note that, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I want you to I feel like I did the, oh I my. did this to him in the first panel we did together <laughs> yeah. too. I feel, I'm, I'm director. So I just uh, <laughs> you stand back and watch. It. Well, yeah. maybe maybe yeah. you can. Uh, this, <laughs> I, I think whatever. Like if you're gonna, I think writing is the most important thing on a small budget. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're, you know, I, I think if you if you're making movie and this is tended towards rather than writing like prose and fiction, it's tended more towards uh, film. Mm -hmm. But. Um, uh, the, the one way you can really exceed your budget is by spending more time in writing mm -hmm. um, and, and understanding and I think you know honestly we were talking about it made me think we were talking about Carpenter mm -hmm. his, his early movies failing probably helped him mm -hmm. because, sure it because it forced him to work within these per parameters of budget yep. in, in creative ways and that's the most important thing. So, like, I, like I have a screenplay that we're about to be in production for, and I wrote it distinctly in one for one location, which I own, and uh, for three actors, and that's it. Like, and just like I knew my resources, I know, like, I, you know, I I knew exactly what I could get a hold of, and everything else was written within those parameters, and it forced me to be as creative as possible. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's really important. Like what it, what makes um, these indie films, the Benson and Moorhead, like their writing is really good, phenomenal. You know, and, um, and same I think thing that's, with Pietrowski and Collins that I was just talking about. That's that's their bread and butter, the writing. Yeah. Dark Times is the first movie. I knew it would. Just oh yeah, that's a good. Head. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah Kids on Bikes, yeah. except Dark. Yeah, but limitations make you more creative. Yeah. yeah. I totally believe that. I do too. It's kind of like the chart is, it's like a pyramid or a triangle. You've got time, you've got money, and then you've got quality. Yep. And so one of them is going to suffer, right? Yeah, yeah. And so when you don't have any money, then you can see where that, that chart goes. Yeah. Yeah. If, uh, what is it? Uh, cheap, fast, and good. Pick two. Yeah, pick two. <laughs> and if you can do two, you can make it. You can make it work, I promise you. Because I've done, I have done stuff that I'm proud of on zero dollars. Like the most money I spent was the pizzas that I bought for my crew. <laughs> Literally, that was the most money I spent. Are you talking about quality? People will be more than happy. Yeah. Um, it just so happened that the year we had Joe Lansdale as our uh, guest of honor, and I'm a huge fan of his. And one of the movies made from one of his short stories is Bubba Hotep, mm -hmm. which if you've never seen it, you brilliant, see it. brilliant movie. And Bruce it just Campbell. so happened that at work we had a book signing with Bruce Campbell, who played the lead character in that. And so I have signatures from both of them on the DVD, and I was showing it to Bruce, and he said, I loved being in this movie because the writing was so good. And, you know, this is, this is a guy whose bread and butter is movies. Getting smashed yeah. in the face with stuff. Yeah. And you know I believed Ossie Davis was JFK. I believe oh, totally. that. I believe that hundred percent. It's a great movie. Because that's what a movie tomorrow in the video. Room. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You laugh the yeah. first way and the, the first time you watch it you laugh all the way through and the second time you watch it you cry. 
you know, it's just the if the writing is so good, you realize it, it's an, a it's a real roller coaster. It yeah, really is. just fabulous, fabulous. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very cool. Yeah, absolutely, and such a unique, crazy, wonderful story. Anything you know? by Joe Lansdale. Like oh yeah, his, he's uh, he's great. Yeah. Um, his horror. John is dies at the end. Is him too, right? No, no that's David Wong. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Although, if you're looking for great, funny horror, uh, John Dies at the End is the first book. <laughs> the best book title ever. Um, this book is full of spiders. Seriously, dude, don't touch it. It's the second book. And the third, bo the third book is, what the hell did I just read? Yeah, and that author's <laughs> name is actually, he's gone to his a real, yeah, his real, real name. name. Hargan, I can't remember his Something, first name. Yeah. P-A-R-G-I-N. But he writes, he, it's the pseudonym of David Wong because that's the main character in all right, of the yeah. books. But so. he got, got a little flack yeah, for appropriating an Asian name when he's not Asian. So, um, and he should have gotten the flack, uh, you know, but um, but it was the character in the book. Yeah. It was a meta, sort right. of a meta exploration of the, everything. Don't be afraid to explore some of those things. Just be ready for the feedback, you know, or the blowback or whatever it is. You can write about anything. You, you just got to take the consequences that you do when you do. So right, I yeah, like in books, I'm like I um, am fine with offending people. I just want to intentionally offend them and not inadvertently offend them. <laughs> and that's a matter of like awareness. So like uh, on this book, I, you know, I have sensitivity readers because it deals with mm -hmm. like um, it deals with South American dictatorships and it deals with like uh, the American South in like the 30s. Like I had to make sure it was read for, because I don't want to inadvertently offend right. anybody. You yeah. know, you want to deliberately. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, um, was, the 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 five star reviews. I love reading the five star reviews. I love you know anybody likes getting prices. I really love the one star reviews, especially if they write a paragraph or two, because I want to know they hated my book. They really, really hated it, and here's why. And it's like you know what. You were paying attention, weren't you? I, I say to this day that a one star review is just as good as a five star review because you had a very specific reaction to yeah, it. A strong yeah. reaction. I, I'll tell you right now, I can tell you movies that I hate, like that I walked out of to this day, right? And I can tell you movies that I love, but my biggest cardinal sin of any movie is I don't remember anything about it 10 minutes That's later. Yeah. Yeah. The boring. Yep. And it's, it's 90% of movies. No it's way. just like, oh, that was a thing. Wow, okay, cool. I just spent 90, 90 minutes doing that, I guess. Yeah. And they all win the Academy Awards. <laughs> <laughs> you get the impression, my impression is that an awful lot of horror films, uh, there are some gems that are coming out now, but there are also a lot of them are very bland and like cookie cutter. It's like the same thing I've seen again and again. I mean, that's always going to be the case. Um, there's just going to be a lot of people out there that aren't super creative, um, that have the resources available to them. Um, and so they're just going to throw together something that's just sort of pedestrian, you know, and just kind of bland, like you're talking about. But I think also it's because Hollywood, if it's through the studio system, and the, it, Hollywood is risk averse. Yes. yes. Sure. So that is why we get they remakes. Want to make something that made money before. Right. Exactly. So it's real close to it. Like funny, funny story. Um, I'm friends with a. I'm not going to tell you the guy, but I'm friends with a, a, a screenwriter who wrote one of the Marvel movies, mm -hmm. and um, he was tasked or asked to. Um, Create, you know, what they're searching for are IPs, recognizable names. That's what they want. So when they remake, uh, you know, the Avengers, not the comic book, but like the Avenger spy, film, <coughs> or they remake the monsters or whatever, it's because it's a, a recognizable IP. And um, this screenplay writer was like, yeah, they asked me to, they did a bunch of focus groups, and the thing that everyone around the world was aware of. Uh, well, we want this to be a vehicle for Chris Evans, but everyone around the world is aware of the Bermuda Triangle. Mm -hmm. Everyone in the world knows the Bermuda Triangle. It has great IP, but no, no stories about. It. So we're gonna, we want you to write a screenplay about the Bermuda Triangle with Chris Evans in mind, right? And that's that's Hollywood, right? That's why you get these, you know, someone has to be attached. You know, you have to have an attached director, and then they have to focus group it and do a profit and loss to figure out 
how is this going to make money? Like, like so they did focus groups in, in Asia, which is a big market. Like, like that's oh, yeah. where you make money. That's where you make all your money now. Yeah. Um, so in Asia, everyone in Asia knows about the Bermuda Triangle. So it's it's you know it's it's a that's why you get design by committee products, right? And that's why they suck. Sorry, kid. I'm, we've been cursing, and I forgot there's a kid in here. <laughs> oh. And now you've made her cry. I know. It's like, well, we talked about Marvel properties, and some people are very sensitive about that. Now. That's great. Oh, okay. Okay, good. Okay. 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 But it is but yeah, it's, I mean, yeah. that's that's what makes something like Blumhouse so great is that he just gives um, an artist five million bucks and he's like, I don't care. It's five million bucks. It's not going to break me if I lose that. I can make he's like, I can make the five million bucks back without a doubt. You know, so he's like, I'm going to break even on this no matter what. So Jordan Peele, here's five million bucks. Why don't you go make it up? You know, change the whole thing. Yeah. You know? What what made that incredible is the writing. Yeah, like it, like it, like the budget for that movie couldn't have been, you know, I mean, obviously it's five million or whatever less, right. but five million or less is the the yeah. Blumhouse, you know. So. I guess it would be fewer. Fewer, yeah, yeah, you're right. But <clears throat> but yeah, so they'll take you know, so they'll make some weird shit, you know, because like they just we can make that back. We don't care. Even if we just have to sell it to streaming or whatever, we can make it back. That's, they've done it on several of their times yeah. already. Or they're just like, ooh, this is maybe not a theatrical one. We can maybe release that on Amazon Prime. <clears throat> and another version of that is like, oh, let's make Tremor 7, and it can be an empty box with the Tremor's name on it. As yeah. long as we don't spend us over a certain mind. amount, we're guaranteed to make the money. Uh, yeah. Well, it's what happened with Hall um, <laughs> Hall <sighs> Halloween Ends, right? It was $45 million the first weekend, right? Everybody, I don't, I mean, there are some people that like it. Gen for general purposes, most people are very not happy with what they got. But it made $45 million the first weekend because it's Halloween, right? And then if you notice, it went to like $9 million the second weekend. It was like one of the biggest drops I've ever seen, you know. And the, the people were like, well, it's because it's on streaming or it's on, you know, and it's like, well, the no, Halloween Kills not. was on streaming, on streaming too, day and day. Why didn't that kill the bot? Was it because this one's shitty? You know, maybe, maybe. You know, but they don't care because, like, they didn't spend $45 million on the new the Halloween movie. So it's all gravy now, you know. They don't even, you know, like, yeah, just let Peacock have it now. Who cares? So it's just one of those things, you know. It's like a, it's a box that has, it has name value. That, that used to be a huge thing in the 80s and 90s. How many Silent Night, Deadly Night movies are there? <laughs> Five, Five, six? There's a bunch. Yeah. <clears throat> Who else has some bold horror statements? Well, Anybody? I was gonna say, questions? I just really like your, um, just take your damn phone out and make something. Oh, yeah. I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen? You don't have to show it to anybody if you don't like it, if it's like embarrassing or whatever. I certainly didn't show some of the early stuff that I did or like the early stuff that I wrote where I'm just like, yeah, that just needs to go in a box for me and nobody else gets yep. to see this ever, you know? I wrote a book and it's just fucking terrible. It is just I, like it's, it's sitting in a box in my house right now. I'm almost embarrassed that I wrote it. But, you know, like it's one of those things. Like I, I just had to get it out, right? And then, you know... The next time that I did something, it was a little bit better, yeah. and, you know. So yeah, it's fail, about, fail better, fail better. Yeah, yeah. the first, no, the first, the first step of being good at something is kind of sucking at something. Yeah. I mean, Finn from Adventure Times, one hundred percent right, or Jake, excuse me, not Finn. And you know, it doesn't matter how much money you throw at something; it the doesn't story make it better. Isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, how much money did they spend on Cowboys and Aliens? Which I sort of like twenty-five million or something like that. I that movie I did was too, fun. It's, yeah, you can't call well, it a good I movie. I fell asleep you can't call twice it fun. in Prince Princess or Prince Valerian in the Thousand Planets. Oh, that's uh, terrible. Yeah. It was beautiful. Two hundred fifty million. But I couldn't figure out what the heck they were talking about. The original Avatar. It was so pretty. But it yes. was so bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or it wasn't even bad. It was just a little better. It was It was bland. You know, it was it was not terrible. Really it just hit all the though. beats mm -hmm. exactly when you expected them. It was a story that had no surprises. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it was like yeah. had a good villain. The villain Stephen Lang's amazing in that movie. Yeah. But, but he's better in the one where he's a blind guy. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, don't breathe. Yeah, yes. don't breathe. That's a good horror movie. Yeah, and that had a budget of maybe. 
like I would say it had maybe a three million dollar budget, yeah, like and I would bet a million dollars of it was just to him. Barbarian's another example. I didn't really. Barbarian was not my favorite movie. Some yeah, people really love Barbarian. It feels like two movies that they smash together to me, but that doesn't matter because other people really dug it, you know. Yeah. And like, it's made all this money now. I think Barbarian is notable. I did not like Barbarian, mm-hmm. for, but I really appreciated the fact that they broke form. Yeah. So that it's like a movie. Talk about filmmaking rules. It's, yeah. yeah. It's like thirty filmmaking. minutes of a movie, and then it stops, and a new movie starts, and then you, later you see how they connect, and it's not you know it's not groundbreaking, but. Like I, I, I really appreciate that that they mm-hmm. just said fuck, fuck the three act structure. We're yeah. gonna do it like this, you know. I like, I like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm glad that people like the movie because I, like, I might not like it, but yeah, I, I'm not. I'm never I never get to succeed. I'm not the gatekeeper. You know? um, I'm not the guy who says what's good. And bad. <clears throat> I have an opinion on what I like and what I don't like. Yeah. And if you liked it, I'm happy for you because, like, I'm glad that somebody enjoyed it because yeah. I certainly did not. But you know, in, in uh, author author land, when we talk about it, we say I was just not the right audience for it, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and that's true. I mean, it's like ultimately, it I was just not the right audience for that for that movie. But, yeah, um, yeah, we got what, like got two minutes, but yeah. When you hear about uh, whether to publish yourself or go to a publisher, one of the reasons is supposed to be the publisher is a gatekeeper. And yet, for an artistic viewpoint, that's a negative. I think that you, oh, yeah. you know, but you, but you have to throw a lot of. You have stuff. to make concessions if you're going to go to a publisher. It's, well, it's, yes. it's like it's it's like or they're Hollywood. not going to let it's like Hollywood. They're not going to let something through if it's formulaic. Yeah. Or something. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. But you have to make sure that when you self-publish stuff, that it is grammatically correct. Well, sure. It doesn't have sure. and. Unfortunately, it's really a great deal of self-published stuff did not have that no. professional editor. Right, it. right. It, it, that's so true. that's where the the public, you where the gatekeeper is there. helpful. Yeah. Well, to, to yeah, but out. it's like then you pick out the you get gem the stuff that might be bland, but you don't tend to get the really I, Well, stuff. and I'll say this: just in, I'm a traditionally published author, so I I went through that method of going through publishers. Um, for me, it was important that my books go in, in bookstores, mm-hmm. and if if you unless you go through traditional publishing, they have a you know a chokehold on all yep. the distribution. So you might get in a little mom and pop shop, shop here and there, but right, not getting but in Barnes and Noble. Yeah. It has to be very is the thing. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. kind of shrunk yeah. as far as the amount of bookstores. And stuff. I will be pimping these. Well, hey, uh, everybody, do uh, you know? <laughs> Everybody talk about your stuff real quick before we wrap up. So, uh, my latest movie is Revenge of Zoe. It's on Tubi for free. Tubi's amazing. Awesome. Tubi has everything. Literally everything. And it's a comedy. Yeah. We didn't even talk about comedy before either. Uh, yeah. Damn it. Uncle Peckerhead. Uncle, oh, God, I love that movie. Tremors. Tremors is one yeah. of the best creature features ever. Oh. Um, my name is John Horner Jacobs. I've got like 11 novels but these are my two uh, most recent um, out and you can get them in any bookstore there's none in the, the dealer's room though no one no sellers have them they didn't, they didn't get any I don't know uh, I just got the rights on, back on my stuff from traditional my publisher went under um, so I'm in the process of working and getting those back out I'm going to self-pub them but I'm going to go through Ingram Spark because I want them in the store where I work. <laughs> so. I'm currently selling nothing, but you can come back into this room at 9 p.m. and watch uh, Mary Fuck Kill um, Universal <laughs> Monsters if you want. It should, it should be fun. Godzilla. Yeah. All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. That's not Universal. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, please check out D&D Journey of the 5th Edition and Ragnarok and roll a Scion Hero to Ragnarok Story. Also, check out our Patreon page for more content and behind-the-scenes things, as well as joining us for a one-shot game or two.